Dr. Salim, alhamdulillah, he has um, been an amazing source of inspiration for the Muslim community then in Ottawa, and then he left and came back. It seems like he hasn't been able to settle without coming back. So he loved Ottawa so much. So alhamdulillah, we thank him for that. Uh, he has been, alhamdulillah, very active with Abrar School, have done amazing job. And at this point of time, he is back again in Abrar School, alhamdulillah. And that's an opportunity for us to utilize his knowledge and his experience, inshallah, with, uh, with community development. Inshallah, he will start his presentation right away, and I'm going to deal with the noise at the back. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ما شاء الله um, it was only just a few years ago that we were praying in a one room musalla uh, indeed Allah سبحانه وتعالى has blessed this community and we have to say Alhamdulillah for that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all those who went knocking on different doors to raise the funds and to lay the foundations of this masjid. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless this community. Um, after having been away for uh, three years almost, uh, so it was re really very pleasant uh, experience to come back to a crowded parking lot in a SNMC, to see the masjid crowded, to see the, mashallah, the Abrar school students, now young men and women, leading the youth halaqas here. So I'm so proud of you, mashallah. Many of you came and said salam, so I'm so, so proud of you to see you. And, and, and you know, um, it's good to see that, alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we hope that our effort was some, somewhat involved in that, inshallah. So, um, Imam Ziyad asked me um, about the topic. I said, okay, um, I'll talk about himma. So, maybe we start with that. And let's begin with, what is himma? Anyone wants to... I hope to, inshallah have a conversation with you instead of having a presentation. What in your mind is himma? The will, okay, mashallah. And any other words that come to our mind? Okay, so Imam Ziyad is saying aspiration. Passion, mashallah. So, so as it's having the will to complete an action, right? When you're set out to do the action. And there are many words that can add different dimensions to the word himma, right? So those are all the different words that, can, that we can use to describe different aspects of himma, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept a huge reward for those people who decide to stay on the truth, right? And then stick to it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَاتُوا So, and in another place in, in Surah Al-Ahqab, similar words, uh, describing the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept for those people who say that they believe in Allah and they stick to it, right? And they, they have this himma to stay that course all the way to the end, right? And when we think about himma, it is not just uh, a state, right? It is a continuous condition of maintaining that will, that fortitude, that, that conviction, right? Throughout one's life. It's, it's, we need to keep it going. It's a lifelong cycle, right? Now, why are we talking about himna? 
right? This is important for us. And, and my answer is very obvious. Many of us are parents, and we have experienced the challenges that our youth, and even ourselves, living in a, in a society where we are always in a constant state of high stress because, of, because we are all, always negotiating our identity with the Canadian identity. We are always trying to negotiate what it means to be a Muslim with what it means to be a Canadian. We are negotiating the values that I'm required to hold dear to my faith with an attack on my values in the popular media, right? So, so doing all of this, it puts a lot of stress on anyone. And some, for some of us, and maybe for many of us, we reach a place where we are saying, when is this going to end? When will the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come? Right? And this is even, this situation is described in the Quran, right? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He clearly says that those who are with the Messenger, they finally, after having put up with so much hardship, they said what? Mata Nasrullah. Where is the help of Allah? And Allah's response is very quick. Allah. In the Nasrallahi Qareeb. Indeed, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear, very close. But the human eye is not able to perceive that. We are limited by our experiences. We are limited by what we, how far we can see into the future. We are sometimes short-sighted by our lack of knowledge about our historical past. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has changed the condition of the people over centuries. Those who are in similar situations. We don't have that 2020 hindsight that history gives us when we look. Now, a, a good question to ask is how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him a to the prophets. How did he make sure that they were able to continue on their mission and stay on it till the end? And when you look at our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you'll see that one of the most testing moments for him was when he received the revelation. And he received the revelation and we know the story, he comes to his wife, shaken, trembling, and telling his wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, cover me, cover me. And in that moment, we know the surah that was revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals to him, Ya ayyuhal muddathir. That, oh, the one who is covered in garments. Now, believe it or not, in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept the formula for maintaining one's himma. Let me repeat that. In these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept for us the formula for maintaining him. Let me share with you how. And you will see this pattern occur again and again and again throughout the Quran. You will see the same pattern. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first step in attaining him is Ya ayyuhal muddathir qum fa'andir To be aware is awareness. The second step is teskia, purifying ourselves. The third step is deep knowledge, having deep understanding of our condition. I will explain to you, to you this in more detail. And then the fourth one 
is hegna, wisdom, application of that knowledge. You will see this pattern occurring again and again and again throughout the Quran. Let me share with you another example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another place he says, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالِ مُمِينَ Same pattern. Look at it. Awareness. Right? يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ Awareness. And then, وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Purification. And وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ Knowledge. And the fourth one, Hikmah. You'll see this pattern come again and again and again in the Quran. In fact, this cycle is very intentional by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Who knows the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam which is similar to this? What does Ibrahim alayhi salam say? Rabbana wa ba'ad fihim rasoolam minhum yatlu alayhim ayatihi what does he say? What's the next word? وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah responds to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. But he corrects Ibrahim alayhi salam by putting the right order of the steps of how to maintain him. Ibrahim, he mentioned تَسْكِيَةً at the end. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put it he, he reordered the steps. He said, no. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ No. He said, يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ Look at it. يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ So, تَسْكِيَةً comes second, not last. Then comes علم. Then comes application of the knowledge. It's a cycle. So, this cycle, this cycle, let me quickly, this is the complete cycle of how to maintain him. Now let me go into more detail about, by sharing with you some tips that highlight each step of the cycle. Of how we can apply this cycle with ourselves, with our kids, with our families, as a community, as a society, as a country. Right? The secret is in this process. So first tip, our perspectives. Maintaining the right perspective. So when we talk about perspectives, perspectives are important because they are key to motivation. Right? The right, the, the wrong perspective can completely demotivate a person. We can look at the same scenario, the same situation, but see entirely two different things. We can either see this glass as what? Half full or half empty. And depending on our conclusion, it informs how much we are motivated to do something. So perspectives are very important. And sometimes perspectives are so important, let me, let me play this video clip, watch very closely what happens. So depending on the lens that we have, it can completely alter the way we look at the world and the way we understand and, in, and how we respond to it. There was a time in humanity when people believed that the world was flat. That was a perspective. It was a skewed perspective. And because of that skewed perspective, people 
incurred great harm. They were limited by their perspective. They thought that if they sailed off into the ocean, they would fall off the face of the earth. So a skewed perspective can be very debilitating. It can really cut down one's willpower, one's direction in life. Let me share with you a very, I have, mashallah, two PhDs here in this uh, masjid sitting here, so you have to excuse me. But let me share with you an experiment that was done that highlights the importance of how skewed perspective can really harm a person. Uh, a team from, um, I believe, I'm forgetting the name of the university, it was not Harvard, but the, the person, the main, uh, the first per author on this research was Seligman, so it is known as Seligman study. And uh, it's quite common and famous in the field of education. So what he did, he took a bunch of uh, young, he took a bunch of dogs, and he put them in a room, and in the room, what he did, the floor of the room was electrified. So the flo floor of the room, was electrified. And there was a button which was connected to the floor and what they did, they put a dog in there and they administered shocks, electric shocks. I'm sure you can't do that anymore uh, under the current social political climate. So they administered these electric, electric shocks to dogs and they were a little bit painful and the dogs could stop the shocks by pressing the red button. That was on the wall, that was reachable to them. So pretty soon in this first trial, the dogs learned to press the button because they learned that once they press the button, the shocks stop. Then what he did, he took another group of dogs and he placed them in the same similar room, but what he did, the only difference, he disconnected the button. He disconnected the button and he administered the shocks. So the team administered the shocks and the dog, he, it kept pressing the button. Nothing happened because the button was disconnected. The dog just laid down and gave up. And they continued to give shocks to the dog and they continued to you know, coax him to come towards them, nothing happened. The dog just gave up. It endured, continued to whine from the pain, and it endured the shock. Then what he did, he changed the experiment a little bit. He took the first group of dogs, the, the one that were able to press the button and stop the electric, electric shock. He took the first group of dogs, and what he did, he erected a barrier in between. One side of the barrier was electrified. The other side of the barrier was not electrified. And when he administered the shock, the first group of dogs, all of them consistently, what they did, after they, they pressed the button, nothing happened. They jumped over the wall and they escaped. They were able to find another solution. Then he put the second pair of group of dogs into the same situation. And the wall, by the way, was not very high. The, the barrier in between was not high. They could have just jumped over it. They continued to administer the shocks, but the dogs laid down and endured it. They didn't do anything. From this, the team concluded, and they came up with this idea of learned helplessness. That a skewed perspective in this case, the skewed perspective was what? No matter what I do, I will not be able to change my situation. This was the skewed perspective. So the second group of dogs, no matter what, what I do, it's not going to make a difference, so they gave up. So even when they saw a path where they could have helped themselves by jumping over that barrier, they did not try it. Because of this feeling of learned helplessness. 
Now, of course, um, we are not dogs. We don't think like dogs. We can't compare human beings to dogs. Right? But what research tells us that people, for example, who are living in abusive relationships, they know a path. They see a path. It's available to them. But they don't help themselves. This is a consistent pattern we see where they have even human beings fall into this error of learned helplessness. And there are many skewed perspectives that as Muslims we come across in the popular media, right? Here are some of those. All of these are skewed perspectives that can be very debilitating that can lead us to a place of learned helplessness. That no matter what I do, no matter what I'm, I, I, I will try, it's not going to make a difference. And you see that many Muslims have fallen to this prey, and it's a very common phenomena within the Muslim community, unfortunately. Now, here's the thing, though. These skewed perspectives, they're all what? External. They're actually much easier to deconstruct, understand, and overcome. We can rationalize our way out of it. We are not like dogs. Alhamdulillah, Allah SWT has given us a much better thinking capacity. We are able to rationalize our way out of it. But let me share with you some other skewed perspectives that are internal that can really suck your energy and your willpower and your ability to, make, to effectuate change in your life. My favorite one, these are all skewed perspectives. My favorite one is this one, Law of the Instrument. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's the Law of the Instrument. So, I have a hammer, I have a solution, I, I, it works on one thing, then I make a false assumption that the same solution, if I apply it to other situations, I'll get the same result. It's a skewed perspective. Right? And we see this in the communities. On a community level, we see that on an individual level, we see that within the family. Right? Sometimes as parents, we try, uh, somebody was telling me that they remembered my presentation from three years ago where, where I spoke about uh, Tatwadi. That's the way we've always done it. Right? That's a skewed perspective. It comes from this, you know, the way my dad parented me, it worked. So if I apply the same strategies with my son or daughter here in Canada, I'll get the same results. And I do it before I know it, what, I, what happens? There's, there's chaos in the family. Right? Here's another skewed perspective. Who knows what IKEA effect is? What is the IKEA effect? By the way, these are all terms in sociology and in education, right? The IKEA effect is, since I made it, it must be good. <laughs> since I made it, it must be good. Uh, Post-purchase rationalization. <laughs> I spent a lot of money, I bought it. I know it's not working. But I make a lot of different excuses to validate my purchase. Right? We know about placebo effect, we know about authority bias. Just because somebody is in a position of power say something, right? Mr. Trump is really good at it. He knows how to use that. Right? He knows how to sway people with his authority. Right? And you have authority bias. So you have all of these skewed perspectives. Right? That can really put you in the wrong direction. And because they can put you in the wrong direction, what happens because of these skewed perspectives, we start putting all our energies in the wrong direction without seeing the result, result that we are hoping to achieve. And that is very demotivating. 
for anyone. And it becomes very hard to maintain that himma, that willpower to continue. Because you, you keep acting on this skewed perspective, and it doesn't work. And by the way, we see this in our gatherings, right? We see this in our gatherings. Brother, how can one person change the whole world? My effort will not bear any fruit. I'm just one person. This problem is much bigger than me. But when you look at, and then you have people with the conspiracy theory mentality, right? Brother, they're out to get us. Who's they? How are they out to get us? It's not defined. But we see this as a, as a very common you know, conversation point amongst us as a Muslim community. You know, brother, they're, they're out to get us. They're planning. They're always planning. They do this. And what that does, that kind of conversation, validates the skewed perspective that as an individual, I cannot bring about any change. On the contrary, when you look at history, Quran tells us what? كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, how many a time? There are a few. Come in fi'atin qaleelatin. A few. Overcame many. With the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Skewed perspective. Skewed perspective leads to misunderstandings. Putting our energy in directions that is nothing but a waste of time. In fact, when you look at history, when we look at history, when you look just at the lives of the Anbiya, you will see that it all started with one person. Bringing about that change in their society, in their community, and eventually changing the whole world. With that simple slogan that every, Anbiya, every messenger, every prophet that, that ever came in the history of humanity, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. One person stood up. Every time. You see this in the example of Ibrahim. You see this in the example of Nuh. In the example of Musa. Alayhi wasalam. You see this again and again and again. In fact, when you look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, after he came back from Taif, as he was entering Mecca, in the, one of the darkest moments in his life, where it may have appeared to a normal human being that all doors have been shut for me. I have no other way out of this difficulty. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which surah does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal to him? Which surah? Which surah? Come on. Who knows? As he is entering Mecca, he is about to enter Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this surah to him. Which surah is it? Hmm? No, that's a beautiful story. I will share that with you also, inshallah. About surah al duha The surah that is revealed to the Prophet in this darkest moment is surah Yusuf. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows him how he can take a person like Yusuf alayhi salam and put him in a position of power. From the well, sold as a slave, put him in the position of power. Because the human being is prone to these skewed perspectives. And we start thinking, how can my situation change? Can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really pull me out of this? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him Surah Yusuf. Not that the Prophet had any doubt. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding him. Giving him this himma. That don't. The, the story that the sister was referring to, Surah Al-Duha, when did this happen? 
when, when was Surah Al-Duha revealed? It was at a time when, after the first revelation, the people, as we know, after the first revelation, the revelation stopped. After Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khala. Some scholars say it stopped for six months, some say it stopped for a few weeks, and some say it stopped for a few months. That's not the point. The point is it stopped to the point that the people, Kuffar of Mecca, they started saying and they started ta taunting the Prophet ﷺ by saying, See, your Lord has abandoned you. Where is this Allah subhanahu wa that you talk about? Where is this Ar Rahman that you talk about? He's, he's abandoned you. So, so the Prophet ﷺ, he was feeling this. Just received the mandate of being a prophet. He is still not trained completely into the school of prophethood. So how, how does Allah subhanahu wa train him? He talks about perspectives. He talks about perspectives. What duha? Even the word duha, it is, it is so beautiful. It is talking about the changing of perspective. Because Allah subhanahu wa he is here talking about a time the time of duha when it is changing, the sun is changing, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, What duha? Well, layli idha saja. Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma khala. Your Lord has not abandoned you, He's not upset with you. Don't listen to those people. If you listen to those people, they're going to skew your perspective. But then look. Now he talks about perspectives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma khala. Wa lal akhiratu khayrun laka min al-ula. We may think that this is it. This is the world. That's all I have. But Allah is teaching the Prophet No, nope, this is not it. Your akhirah is going to be much better than this. Correcting that skewed perspective. And then. Don't worry. Allah is going to give you and give you and give you until you are pleased. Until you are pleased. Correcting those skewed perspectives. Because sometimes we find ourselves in a situation. I have lost my job. My child is sick. I'm running from one doctor to another to find the cure. And we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then asking him to go back and reflect. Didn't, weren't you an orphan? And we enriched you, we gave you family, we protected you. So again, this surah, Zakallah sister, for reminding me, it, it is talking about how about the importance of having the right perspective in life. Because if we don't have the right perspective, it can destroy us. Here's another story that I want to share with you. I'm looking at when is Salatul Isha? 8.45, so it's 8.21. Okay, here's another story. Again, a story that involves skewed perspective. You know who Hanzala radiallahu anhu was? He was not just any Sahabi. He was one of the scribes of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was one of those who wrote the Quran. We owe it to Hanzala when we read the Quran. So Hanzala, he comes out of his house saying, Hanzala has become a hypocrite. Abu Bakr, he runs into Abu Bakr as Siddiq, he listens to Hanzala and he says, What are you saying? What is this nonsense that you're saying? Don't say that. Why are you saying this? So Hanzala, then he explains to him, Oh Abu Bakr, Aren't you, when you're with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
and he's describing Jannah to us and he's describing the Jahannam to us and don't we see that in front of us don't we feel that as if we can see it and then we feel so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we are in the presence of the Prophet and then when we go home we get busy with our wife with our kids with our business and we don't feel the same way we don't have that same level that same connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Abu Bakr Siddiq says yes I feel the same too so see Hamzala has become a hypocrite he feels differently in front of the Prophet and he feels different when he's at home in his privacy so Abu Bakr is convinced now oh subhanallah this is something he didn't think about they say let's, all, let's both go to the Prophet and, and tell him about this so they go to the Prophet and they explain to him what they're feeling. So the Prophet he what does he comment? What was his comment? Who knows? What does he, what does he tell them? It's normal, sah, and what else? Jazakallah khair. So he says, if we are like this, then the angels will be walking amongst us. Meaning to say that we are not angels. This is being human. To feel this ups and downs in our iman. Right? So, the Prophet ﷺ, he corrected Hanzala's perspective. Because his, he had this cute perspective that in order to be a good Muslim, my iman always has to be here, always. Now I understand amongst the scholars there's a deba debate about can Iman go down and up. There's a debate on, on this amongst the scholars. We will not get into this. Amongst the Muslim scholars, right? But let's not get into this. But here the, what, the point that I want us to focus on in this story is how the Prophet ﷺ is correcting this perspective. Now, how can we maintain this hymn? The answer is very simple and it may seem very simplistic. Right? The first one is to pray five times a day. Why? You see, in Salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept the mechanisms to always reconnect with reality. You know this, this picture, this graphic that I shared with you, this one. Seeing half full or half empty. Whenever we say Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, when we recite Surah Al Fatiha in Salah, when we say Alhamdulillah, we are saying what? The glass is half full. It's not half empty. Alhamdulillah. Maybe I lost my job. One door closed for me. Nine doors are open. Alhamdulillah. But what is the condition of the human being? He or she gets fixated on that door that closed. And does not see the other doors that are open. And starts complaining. So whenever we say Alhamdulillah, teach it to your kids. That's what Alhamdulillah means. Every time we say Alhamdulillah in Salah, we are reconnecting back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, yes, there's lots of opportunities for me in this life. Allah has blessed me. Allah is with me. Alhamdulillah. I'm seeing life half full, not half empty. That's what it means to say Alhamdulillah. So the first thing, dear brothers and sisters and young children, don't lose Salah. Don't lose our prayer. Because it will reconnect us with our reality and help us maintain that right perspective in life. And when we have that right perspective, we will be less prone to have a skewed perspective. That could be very debilitating to our hymna. 
Now, the other thing, the other tip is connect with the Quran. Connect yourself, connect ourselves with the Quran, and connect our kids with the Quran. Because in the Quran, Quran is nothing but what? A response to these skewed per perspectives. You know what are these skewed perspectives? What are these skewed perspectives? These are dhulumat. These are the darknesses of the mind. These are the cognitive darknesses that can blind a person from one's re reality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say? Allahu waliyu alladheena amanu yukhrijuhum min al-dhulumati al-nur. Yukhrijuhum min al-dhulumati al-nur. It is Allah who takes us out of all of these dhulumah. I tell my teachers at Abra Elementary School, this is our job. This is our job with our students to correct their skewed perspectives. See, the act of learning is what? It's dual in nature. You have to unlearn before you can learn. Because if I, if I have the mentality that I know everything, can you learn? Can you fill a glass that is already filled with water? Full of water. No. So part of the education process is to help, and this is what we do at our school. This is what I encourage our teachers to do. The problem, dear brothers and sisters, with our kids, the challenge. For those, I'm not against public education. I taught in public schools. I think public education is one of the best things that can happen to any country because it gives access and it's a gateway out of poverty, out of hardship for many people. And I support public education. But the, in, so when I talk about public schools, I'm not against public education, but I am against the idea of secular education. And there's a difference. Secular education is built on a very big, huge, skewed perspective. What is it? What is secular education? What's the basic foundation of everything comes out of this? What is the biggest skewed perspective, according to Muslims, for secular education? Who can tell me? Give it a shot. OK, you're on the right track. Right? Brother said evolution. So the skewed perspective is God does not exist. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Right? And the entire foundation of secular education in the West is based on this skewed perspective that God does not exist. Things happen. Randomly. There is no intent behind how things occur. It is just random selection of events that lead to a certain outcome. Which, by the way, if you go back and you know, look at evolution, you, you will realize that it is still a theory. But imagine what that skewed perspective does to a person who's sitting eight hours, five days a week, and they're being hammered with this skewed perspective. Every theory, every conclusion, every analysis, every mathematical formula that you study in class is based on this basic premise that God does not exist in secular education. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem. So, for those of us who are sending our kids to a secular school, that is something that we need to tackle. And the best way to tackle is connect them with Salah and connect them with the Quran. Right? And I know that for many of us, some, some, we, may, we, we want to put our kids in 
maybe an Islamic school in a private school, maybe some of us are not able to afford it because Islamic schools are expensive. Just the Abra elementary school fee, it takes more than $5,000 to send a child. Not, not everyone can afford it. So how do we deal with this challenge that we are facing in ourselves and in our kids? And when you look at the, look at the Quran, you will see when you look at the Qur'an, the Qur'an is dealing with skewed perspectives throughout. In a variety of ways. In many, many different ways. If you look at the story of Musa, السلام, if you look at the story of Yusuf, السلام, if you look at the story of all the Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows again and again in the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He shows not only in the stories of the prophets, but in Allah SWT says, "Inna fi khalq al-samawati wal-ard wa ikhtilaf al-layl wal-nahar la ayat li'ulil al-bab." That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is asking us to look at the signs, to study the nature, to see how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala takes care of it. Look at the earth, how it is balanced. Sometimes we think all these events unfolding around us. And it appears that nobody's in charge. Right? All this chaos happening in the world. And we get the feeling nobody's in charge. Skewed perspective. In fact, if you look at the bigger picture, you'll see that if you take the earth, move it a little bit closer to the earth, all the entire atmosphere on the, on the planet will evaporate and light will cease to exist. If you take the earth a few centimeters away from the sun, the atmosphere will liquefy, it will freeze, and life will cease to exist. Who is keeping it in balance? Allah is in charge. But to the human mind, we fall into this fallacy, this skewed perspective that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in charge. So we conclude. So that was my first tip. The first tip was about perspectives. I had some other ones, but I'll tell you here very quickly and I'll conclude with this. Inshallah. But let me conclude with this. Remember the Tazkiyah model that I shared with you in the Quran? Right? So skewed perspectives, that's the first step. Having the right perspective. That's where awareness comes. That's where, that's the first step in maintaining himma, is to be aware of one's reality, is to be aware of one's circumstances. And how we can do that, and that is to maintain our salah and connect with our Quran. I will conclude with this. Jazakumullah khair.